I'll get this underway now. Uh, thanks everyone for coming to the Science Media Centre briefing on cowrie dieback disease. Uh, really lucky to be able to share some of the current uh, research around cowrie dieback ahead of the cowrie dieback symposium, which is taking place in Hokianga this weekend. Uh, we're fortunate enough to have three speakers from the symposium who uh, will be sharing with us uh, the outlook on cowrie dieback disease and also some of the latest research into genetic resistance and also uh, treatments that can be used to hold back the uh, disease. Um, just a slight amount of housekeeping, lines for the attendees will be muted, uh, but we can make them open at the end. And also, if you have any questions answers during the presentation, you can put them in the Q&A box to the right of your screen. Um, our first speaker will be uh, Ian Mitchell, who is from Cowrie Dieback Program. Uh, he doesn't have his slides available at the moment, but he will be able to tell us a bit about the current situation with Cowrie Dieback and the outlook. Our second speaker is Dr. Philip Wilcox from uh, Sound who will be talking about genetic resistance in carry trees and the potential uh, future possibilities for using that as a way to uh, mitigate carry dieback disease. And our final speaker will be Dr. Ian Horner from Plant and Food Research, who will be talking a bit about possible treatments for trees infected with carry dieback and particularly phosphite uh, as a potential agent in that endeavour. Uh, without further ado, I'll hand over to Ian Mitchell from the Cowrie Dieback Program to speak uh, a bit about the disease and the current situation. Kia ora, kia ora, John. Kia ora everybody. Um, so apologies this morning, I've had a few technical difficulties, but uh, I'll get these slides through to John and hopefully they'll be available to you a bit later today. Um, anyway, just to give a brief overview of the Cody Dieback um, disease and the Cody Dieback Program. Uh, my understanding of my role this morning. I'm relationship manager for the Cody Dieback Program. The key part of my role is to ensure that all of the agencies and all of the communities are working collaboratively um, to protect Cody. So Dieback disease was uh, noted as an unwanted organism as a biosecurity threat in 2008. Uh, I think some uh, research from scientists earlier, but in 2008 it was notified in New Zealand as an unwanted organism. Uh, this is Cody dieback disease. Uh, we have been calling it up to now Phytophthora taxon agathis as the holding name, so it's a, a soil-borne um, organism. Phytophthora of the group of um, diseases called Phytophthora uh, would uh, uh, affect the forests all around the world. Uh, microscopic, and it infects Cody tree through the root systems first. <coughs> uh, it starts off as a fine root infection. Um, the fine root infection that's taking place under the, under the ground has uh, been detected for years, so that's something we are still researching. Um, how long is the lag between uh, when a tree may be infected to when we may see some symptoms of the disease. After the tree is initially infected, uh, it starts to form cankers or, or rotting areas on major roots. It climbs up the root system and reaches the base of the tree where we first start to see some visible symptoms. Um, there at the base of the tree you will see uh, bleeding of gum. The gum, gum bleeding um, over time will, or at least the the as it carries on infecting the tree, over time starts to work its way around the base of the tree, and it affect it ring barks the tree, and uh, and um, it basically rots out the cells that transport water and nutrients up the tree. Uh, as the disease advances, the tree tops start to be affected, and so start to see the symptoms up in the leaves, where the leaves will start to yellow brown, thin out, 
and and ultimately um, you'll see dead branches, and ultimately the tree will die. We say probably, uh, well, also as far as we know, almost every tree that's infected eventually dies. So it's um, of great concern to all of us. With the disease, um, at this stage, um, it is in a two major forests, uh, which is Wawa Forest and Waitakere Forest, um, and then in a number of isolated areas uh, throughout Northland, Auckland, and Coindle. Uh, areas uh, of note are Rāia Forest, um, Mangamuka, Omuta Forest in Northland, uh, Waipoa Trounson I've mentioned, Glen Burvey Forest, uh, uh, Whangarei, uh, Ku in the Russell Forest of Bay of Islands. Uh, there's an area in the Kaiwaka to uh, Pākiri zone of, sort of north of Auckland um, where uh, infected a number of private land stands of Cody. Um, including there is a um, pink tree called Puke Roro uh, near Kaiwaka. Uh, so North Shore, Waitakere, in fact, there's a number of um, uh, areas throughout throughout Auckland, particularly out west in the Waitakere area, Titirang area, where there's a lot of um, private land infections. And then more recently, uh, just about the middle of last year, we found it in Whangapoa, uh, um, in the northern end of the Coromandel Peninsula. Uh, what research do we need to do? Uh, so we say that science is critical to inform our program and, and our key objectives. Our key objectives revolve around knowing uh, more about the biology of, of, the, dis of the organism, um, where can we find these? So we're continuing to uh, our surveillance uh, across Cody lands to find the disease. Uh, we need to research how does PTA spread, what are the pathways or vectors of spread, and, and um, what are the risks attached to spread, those uh, vectors, and, and then how can we control PTA in terms of uh, containing it and and possibly uh, control tools, and uh, Ian and Orr will be talking about that soon. Um, all research funded by Cody Dieback Program must address those key objectives. Um, in terms of um, research is then prioritised within those four key objectives, um, the planning and intelligence work stream of the Cody Dieback Program coordinates and contracts all of the research portfolio um, with input from the other work streams, our partner agencies and tangata whenua. We have a technical advisory group for external advice. We have external peer review via um, Quality New Zealand audit and overseas input. And we also get submissions from research providers and community groups. Attached to a science research strategy is also Mātauranga Māori strategy. Uh, the objectives in our Mātauranga Māori strategy is that the place of Mātauranga is understood and applied in encouraging kauri tree and ngahiri health, uh, investigating other uses for forests and kauri that are affected by PTA, predicting the presence of PTA, predicting resistance to PTA, managing and treating trees, infected with PTA and that forests are PTA free, remain PTA free. Cody program will fund or co-fund its highest priorities first, as of course we have limited resources. Um, knowledge gaps for future management of Cody dieback, a very high priority is um, host range. What are species of uh, New Zealand may it be infecting, uh, the vectors of spread, what are the, the uh, pathways, if you like, and, um, and the risks attached to those pathways. That's a high-priority area of research. Disease resistance of PTA.
GTA, and does Cody possess a resilient gene pool? Um, Phil will be talking a bit more about that. That's high priority for the program. Long-term ecosystem impacts, high priority. Health indicators, uh, something that we're working on in conjunction with uh, Matauranga. It's medium to high priority. Holistic health for Cody. Uh, Cody healing, also uh, medium priority. And soil ecology, medium priority. Origin of the disease is low priority. Um, our risk also includes uh, an operations section of the program. Uh, our priorities in, around our operations are working at the right, right scale, so um, not just on infected, small infected sites, but um, uh, managing risk across uh, all regions, prioritizing work and, and targeting our intervention operations um, in terms of uh, public and private land, and we've got some exciting uh, stuff going on in the, in the private land area. Um, design management and implementation, cleaning design, um, cleaning station design and maintenance, risk assessment and risk management. Um, so we continue to research our, you know, um, track up options for dry surfaces to help create dry surfaces and protect Cody roots at the same time. And the other major area of our response is engaging industry communities and individuals um, to be there and to be educated. In terms of industry, we're trying to, uh, in conjunction with industry, um, create best practice guidance uh, with the likes of uh, earth moving industry, forestry industry, nursery, um, horticulture industry, etc. Um, empowering local people so that we have local solutions using local knowledge to help protect Cody um, in specific areas. Um, to be made via capacity building in rural communities and ultimately um, that the ways of messaging and education that you get about Cody dieback will inspire you to uh, take shin and be very hygienic before you reach the forest entrance. So that's my presentation in a nutshell. Great. Uh, thanks for that, Ian. Uh, I'll hand over now to Philip Wilcox, Senior Scientist at Sion. Uh, I just made note that Philip has a limited time with us, so he might not be available for q a at the end but uh, he will be contactable by email. All right. All yours, Philip. Great, very much. Um, do we have slides there, John? Were you going to load those? Uh, yep. So you should be seeing your slides now on the screen. Are they visible? No, not at this point. Oh, hang on. Here we go. Thanks very much. Yeah, and space will progress the slides before the arrow at the top. Thank you. Thanks very much, <coughs> uh, folks, for um, your interest in talk about the prospects for genetic resistance in Cody and what it might mean. Um, this is a shorter version of what I'm going to be talking about on Saturday. Um, and as Ian said, it's high priority in the Cody dieback program. Um, but we're only really just now getting into uh, the research um, that is necessary to identify and utilise um, genetic resistance. Uh, just a little bit about myself, um, I'm a part-time senior research fellow with the University of Otago as well as a senior scientist. So I have a doctorate from North Carolina State University and my PhD area was in um, disease resistance at forest trees. Um, currently, I lead a number of programs, um, including a genome sequencing of radiata pine, and I'm also being involved in um, programs that are uh, about utilising genomic technologies for solving um, problems uh, such as Cody diabetic disease and other, um, other issues associated with 
uh, tree breeding of the species, plus I also do work with the University of Otago um, in human genetics, particularly with Māori and Pacifica populations regarding gout. Um, and I also have a background um, because of my whakapapa. Um, um, I have an iwi role um, in terms of providing technical advice to our iwi around things um, genomics and science in general. Um, we have a background in developing engagement protocols between Māori and um, Western scientists, particularly um, regarding controversial technology. So, <clears throat> key messages, I'll just step through the key messages that I'll be making on Saturday. Um, the first is that we should expect to see uh, heritable genetic resistance to Cody dieback disease. Um, and the reasons why we expect to see that, firstly, there is the observation repeatedly now that there are asymptomatic trees found alongside diseased trees. Um, this in itself is not evident or sufficient evidence of resistance, uh, but it is consistent with extensive evidence of resistance to introduce pathogens across the world, other phytophthora species, as well as a range of other fungal pathogens. Um, just my slides are not moving. Here we go. Um, that resistance um, in the, well, the experience from other species in other parts of the world has been that resistance uh, in the in the host tends to be tends to range from quite rare to uncommon. Um, what does that mean? Well, it's either very, very rare or um, it's it's infrequent, but 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 certainly not difficult to find. Um, and that that distribution just that resistance where it is detected is typically dispersed across the nat natural uh, distribution in a manner that is that is unpredictable. And I'll be presenting ex exemplars of that from um, the Pacific Northwest um, in my talk on Saturday. Third key point is that genetic resistance to introduced pathogens has been extremely useful in forestry species around the world. I've listed a number of examples there, um, in Western Australia, um, to Phytophthora cinnamomai uh, 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 infection, and Phytophthora cinnamomai infection in, in, in West Australia has been extremely severe. Um, <coughs> in managed forests around the world. Um, there are many examples, for example, um, Dothostroma resistant uh, in uh, radiata pine grown in New Zealand um, and Phytophthora cinnamomai resistant the ra uh, in Pinus radiata in Western Australia, uh, Cypress canker resistant um, in Macrocarpa and Lusitanica. Um, and two very well known and documented examples from the US, um, Port Orford cedar resistance in phy to Phytophthora littoralis. Um, and sugar and white pine resistance to white pine blister rust. Now, both blister rust and, and, and littoralis were introduced into the United States or appeared in the United States in the early 20th century, and yet distribution of resistance is, is, is such that, um, it, that uh, it could only have been existing before the pathogen actually arrived. Um, so, and I'll talk a bit more about that at my um, presentation. So um, what will a breeding program require? Um, so assuming that we're successful, well, first of all, the development, development of effective screening systems, and that's the work that we're focusing on at the moment, is to find um, what the, uh, was to develop those screening systems so that resistance can be reliably detected. And then to collect and screen seed, seed links from the entire distribution of, of, of Agathis Australis, of Cody. Um, and that will require coordinated effort across Cody land. Um, and in doing so, I think we will need a meaningful EWI consultation regarding the use of, of such genetic variation and particularly the application of genomics te technologies that could enhance the detection of natural resistance and its utilisation. To have that conversation now um, ahead of time um, in anticipation of, of finding resistance. I really believe that there needs to be strong iwi participation at all stages. And those two points really um, respond to concerns raised in the Y262 Treaty 
claim. Um, this particular example, I guess, is, is um, particular to Cody. Um, and finally, there's some science that needs to be done to, uh, to speed the deployment of any resistance. Resistance, as I said before, may well be rare. Um, so seed production and propagation methods will, need, will probably need some attention. Um, we believe that a genome sequence of CODI will be extremely useful, uh, as well as the associated genomic tools, such as DNA markers, to accelerate the detection and the deployment of resistance. Um, and just trying to get the next slide up. So we're currently at, um, as I mentioned before, um, we're developing greenhouse screening methods in collaboration with the bioprotection core. Um, and there are, are very preliminary results which still need to be ver verified, um, look promising. And then the opportunities, if we find resistance, well, the first thing is that it's just another tool alongside the ones that Ian will talk about, Ian Horner, and other folks um, who are presenting on Saturday. Um, to go, it's essentially another tool in, the, in a suite of tools. Um, and it also provides an opportunity, and I think particularly for iwi for economic development from breeding and propagating resistant, resistant Cody. Um, and there's also an enhanced value proposition for managed Cody forest. Now, work that one of our Scion colleagues will be presenting on Saturday will show that, um, according to some financial analysis, uh, that there is a that there is a financial a worthwhile financial value proposition for managing Cody. As a, as a plantation species. Um, but that is all in entirely contingent upon successful management of PTA. Um, and typically, disease resistance deployment is a very cheap and cost effective means of doing, doing that. But, an also, but also, another opportunity with breeding is to predict, um, predict the iconic trees that we have um, remaining that are vulnerable, um, essentially by planting resistance. Lot, uh, Resistant seedlings and around those those iconic trees um, to provide an additional barrier to the disease. So the bottom line is that I think there are good prospects for achieving genetic resistance in Cody. We've started looking. Um, we need some more conversations, um, but there's some, but but at this stage the, the, we're cautiously optimistic about the. Uh, of the prospects of genetic resistance. And so, as um, John mentioned, I, I have to attend another appointment now, but there are my contact details, um, and I'll be happy to take any questions by email. Thanks very much. Thanks, Philip. Um, if you log out whenever you have to go, that's fine. I'm going to hand over now to Dr. Ian Horner from Plant and Food Research. Uh, for him to share a bit about his latest work with phosphite. Ian, I'm just handing you control now, and your slides should appear on the screen in a moment. Thank you very much for that, John. Thank you for the slides to come up. Uh, uh, I'll be waiting for that. Um, basically, we need to try and find a Oh, first of all, can you, can you hear me okay, John? Yes. Yep, go right again. Okay. Uh, right, yeah, I had a few problems before I was muted. Um, in areas where the, uh, the carotene is already present, we do need to uh, try and find a tool for treating the trees that are either uh, currently infected or under in a threat of attack. Because um, at the moment we just sit there and watch these trees die and we watch the progression of the disease through these forests. Uh, so I've got the slides up. Slides up. It's it it obviously taking a while to load. Um. No, right. um, so, so, so phosphite's a tool that's been used um, both in New Zealand and, and internationally, and particularly in horticulture, but it's also been used a bit in some native plant communities as well, specifically for treatment of control phytophthora diseases. Um, it's got fairly low toxicity. Um, it's biodegradable, so it doesn't accumulate in the environment. And it does seem to be quite specific to Phytophthora and related diseases. So it's, it's particularly quite a useful 
pull directly um, depresses the phytophthora growth, but it also stimulates the plant's host defences. So uh, it's, it's quite a useful tool in that sense. And it can be applied in a number of ways, so that makes it potentially useful. So I guess our brief was to see whether phosphite was a potential tool for, for treating uh, coyote dieback. We started off with some in vitro experiments in the lab just to see whether there was any suppression of phosphite, and found indeed there was, that PTA was quite severely suppressed um, by in addition to phosphite to an agar medium. We moved on to seedling trials in the glasshouse. I'll talk a little bit about those. And then we moved into trials in the forest. Uh, quickly in the forest, in the um, seedling trials in the glasshouse, a whole lot of two or three year old seedlings inoculated with PTA. And then we applied various treatments to see whether we could control the disease. at some of the results that we got. Differences, particularly with phosphite injection, and I'll simplify the, these graphs so that it's only showing the, the phosphite injection result compared to the untreated control. If you look at the top right there, the, the root disease, substantially less root disease in phosphite injected trees. Um, same with the lesion spread, these cankers, um, but other species have talked about setting up the uh, trunk um, totally suppressed in uh, off-site injected trees compared with the untreated. Then you look at tree survival, which is the ultimate measure. Um, every tree that was untreated died, whereas most of the trees that we injected survived. So that was a very encouraging result and gave us the um, confidence to then progress into forest trials. We chose four different forests um, for this uh, trial. Whatapu uh, in the Waitakere Ranges, in Paraitia and Omahuta in Northland. All of these forests were already uh, quite nearly infected with PA. Uh, selected about 160 trees all up uh, for this trial across those sites. Did those trees, some of them injected with a high rate of phosphite, some with a low rate. Um, some had just a single treatment and some had two treatments, and we had untreated controls here as a comparison. And this is just using a standard agrophos, which is an agricultural phosphite um, that is used for, particularly in New Zealand, for treating avocado trees. Looking at the sorts of results we got, um, guts of this graph, basically anything in red shows that there is activity. So this is for the four different sites. If you look across the bottom, you'll see it's either two phosphites, one phosphite, or untreated. And pretty much all of the uh, injected trees are healthy, and the, uh, the lesions have dried up. So instead of these oozing cankers, the lesions have dried up and lost the both heels. They control a lot of the lesions remain active. At the spread of these lesions, age um, based from the same trees, the untreated controls at all four sites, the green bar here, uh, substantially more growth of the lesions uh, in those than in the injected trees. So, one, two. Very interesting result showing that the, the phosphide is indeed suppressing the cankers. The sort of thing we were seeing in treated trees, where the uh, the bark around the lesions that are, uh, are healing, if the bark is peeling back, and there's healthy bark beneath. Very encouraging sign. See similar sorts of peeling in untreated trees, but quite often there is uh, still active cankers beneath the peeled bark, so the trees being out flanked. And then the uh, the phosphite seems to be helping. The So just summary, um, um, enough from our trial so far to say that yes, phosphite is potentially a very useful for treating uh, coyote dieback. But there are a lot of things that we still don't know. And something that must be remembered, it's a treatment, it's not a cure. The disease, the pathogen, is still going to be present in the soil and could reinfect once the phosphite levels have dropped. So it's a temporary treatment that could give the tree some reprieve. 
and there are still lots of un unanswered questions. We really do need to do a lot more research before this is rolled out on mass. We don't know how many treatments are required, how long the benefits will last. We don't know whether trees will fully recover if they reach an advanced stage of decline. And quite a number of other questions, such as dose rates and how do we avoid the phytotoxicity problem. Something that I think phosphite might have a big potential for, and that's for advanced treatment. Other than waiting until trees are in serious decline, in there early, as soon as a tree seems threatened because perhaps its neighbours are showing signs, that is possibly the best time to treat a tree, to give it some protection from the coffee dieback. Um, and it may potentially be a useful tool for trying to contain the spread within a standard forest once it's infected. But that's something we haven't really played with at all yet, and I think in the next round of trials, that is something we can do. So a lot to do, but very encouraging so far. Uh, that's all I've got to say now, and uh, you'll see the extended version on Saturday. Thanks, Ian, for uh, sharing with that, and thanks to all our speakers for um, giving up their time to talk to us briefly about carry dieback. I'm just going to open it up to the floor for any of the people who have dialed in or who have logged in on the online system. If they have any questions for Ian Horner or Ian Mitchell uh, following this presentation. Uh, for those who are logged in online, there's a Q&A box to the right of the screen where they can type in a question and I'm happy to um, pose on to either of the ends. Or if you're on the phone lines now, they've been opened up and you can ask a question directly. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, I have one to kick things off for Ian uh, Warner. Where does phosphite come from exactly? Well, that's a good question. Out of a bottle. Uh, that's a slightly <laughs> facetious answer, but um, it's just a commonly used, commonly manufactured uh, agricultural chemical. A very simple molecule, basically it's processes, H3PO3. But it's um, extracted from phosphate and a couple of chemical conversions, and it becomes the phosphite. So, no, that's a simple molecule, simple chemical, very common worldwide. Great. A question here from uh, Dylan Moran. He asks, the phosphite treatment being used, how much of a revelation is that in fighting dieback? Um, revelation. I, I guess it's a it's a revelation if it would, that could give some real hope for at least treating diseased trees and trying to save particularly important trees, particularly in, no, I'm thinking of a all the yards in the Waitakere Ranges where, where people have got a dozen kauri trees in their backyard that are under threat. Uh, it's going to be a lot cheaper to inject uh, you know, a couple of dollars worth of chemical into a tree than it is to try and salvage that tree or stop it falling on your house. Um, the potential value of it in attainment uh, might be very, very big. Uh, so in that sense, yes, it is a revelation. There's nothing new. It's not new treatment in terms of treating phosphite, uh, no, it's treating phytophthora, but its application in kauri could be patient if it really works. Uh, so just repeat that, that last sentence, Ian, I missed part of that on the line. I'm quite sure which one, but I'm basically saying it's used in, in uh, for treating phytophthora is not new, but it's used for treating body dieback, I guess we can show that it's worked. So that it works and it can be used safely, it's going to be a real revelation and a, a lot of potential. Thanks. Uh, uh, another question I've got there for um, Ian Mitchell is part of the dieback program is focused on community engagement. Uh, how important is that in the larger picture? Uh, are you are you concerned about um, people feeling they're left out of the process? Or is it, and there'll be actually resistance to, to any of the treatment? Um, community engagement we see is, is vitally important to the program overall because we know little about the disease yet. Uh, we're learning more every day, of course. Um, but, you know, we're dealing with basically an unknown organism to science uh, that we alone have been researching over the last 
last three or four years. Um, could have a cure, and our control tools are still um, under research. In you know getting that message out to the community to be precautionary, um, and that our our response at this stage is is really centered around that idea of, of being precautionary, undertaking the hygiene practices, and uh, trying to contain the disease or and and stop it from spreading. So engaging with communities is absolutely critical in terms of people being a aware and b undertaking those those hygiene practices and and ultimately giving our scientists and our uh, mataranga people time to investigate more some options for control or ultimately cure. Um, always be some concern around uh, things like. You know, the idea of shooting up your Cody tree with a chemical, where there will be um, probably pockets of resistance to that sort of idea. Um, so that that sort of treatment is not being rolled out on on public land, uh, but the opportunity is for private landowners to to trial, uh, and we're trying to do that in a way where we can continue to collect that information uh, as it may be useful. Um, but, o but overall, that community engagement um, at all levels, so that it's, uh, starting with industry, industry level, uh, and working with community groups, community organisations, and then right down to the individuals that you know, look over their Cody trees and have a, a special feeling for those Cody trees. Just rolling those people and having them involved uh, uh, is seen as critical in our program. Great. Uh, another question we've got from Gage, a question for either speaker. Uh, is funding looking for these efforts to make Kauri die back? Uh, I understand there were no funding increases in 2012 uh, to 2013 or 2013 to 2014 the government. Is the issue being taken, taken seriously by central government? I um, can answer that um, briefly. Yes. Uh, so there was a major boost in funding um, in the 2014 uh, budget, um, looking forward, uh, so the program has been recognised that it's moving into a long-term management phase. Uh, I believe, uh, Ministry for Primary Industry, which leads the multi-agency Cody Dieback program, uh, has been funded for 10 years with a slight increase in funding on the 2009 to 2014 level. Um, and Department of Conservation have had a major boost in their funding. Um, up to $20 million has been added to the Department of Conservation budget. Typically, um, $10 million of that is targeted to uh, track upgrades and um, uh, basically getting people up off the soil uh, and um, sometimes for planning and research and so on. So, yes. Uh, I think it was agreed uh, by central government that um, that this was important and, and hence the increase in funding. And it was all noted uh, because we had lots of political input from the other parties, Green Party, Labour Party, etc., that it's an apolitical um, issue that all of the all of the various um, political parties are in full support of. Um, funding for this program. Great. Ian Horner, anything to add? No, I don't think so. It's very encouraging to see the um, interest coming from central government. Great. The uh, got another majority oh. of the funding has gone to um, the track upgrading and that side of things, which is very important. I'm not sure if there's been a big boost in the amount available for research. All right, we have another question here from uh, Lois Williams. Is there any sign of dieback in Tane Mata or other iconic trees, and how much would it cost per tree to treat with phosphite? Uh, would we be consulting Tangata Whenua about preventative treatment for these trees? Like a two-part question, um, okay. maybe the first part. 
Ian, I could um, tackle. First part, in terms of any sign on Tane Mahuta, I'm not aware of any symptoms of Kauri dieback on Tane Mahuta. Um, I can cure. Yeah, good. And then, Ian, I guess. Treating, oh. oh, sorry. Sorry, carry on, Ian. Hold on. Oh, I want to say, um, oh. in terms of treating iconic trees, Certainly, there would be consultation with the Kāna Whenua before any um, treatment went ahead, and certainly a, a discussion in terms of prevention. Once get the system sorted out and get a lot more confidence in how we treat and what rates we treat and all those sorts of things, but we've already had discussions with, with various iwi about the, the phosphite work. I think as we get to a stage where we've got more confidence in rolling out, we will be talking many groups, including Tangata Whenua, um, about preventative treatment where trees are under threat. Uh, great, thanks for that. Um, uh, another question here for Ian Mitchell. With what you're saying about potential opposition to using the chemical on public land, have there been any approaches to local councils, DOC or the government about the potential to do that? Uh, the so the dieback program is a multi-agency response. So all of the um, agencies that are uh, in the program, that's Ministry for Primary Industries, Biosecurity, Department of Conservation, and uh, the four regional councils of the Cody Dieback Natural Range, that's uh, Northland, Auckland Council, Waikato and Bay of Plenty, um, are aware of this um, research and including our Tangata Whenua um, Ropu, we're aware of the research, um, and, uh, and we do roll out on public land um, until this research is completed. So that's the first thing. I think Ian Horner's um, research program is a five-year program. Um, and uh, I... Yeah... The, the consultation process has been really critical, and um, Ian Horner has been great um, engaging with communities and engaging with uh, the um, various mana whenua groups um, attached to those specific field trial 